how's everyone doing today? All recovered? Yeah? Right, so Webpack for a better development workflow. Uh, mainly I'm going to cover a better development workflow rather than just Webpack itself, but Webpack's where it comes into. Uh, so you can use the hashtag, the real one. Everyone's using two different ones, but the real one's FUGent, uh, which sounds a bit wrong. Uh, and my Twitter handle is Blake Newman. So as we all know, the front end never stops. Frameworks are constantly coming out. Task runner tools, there's loads of them now. Build tools, again, loads of them, and all the things. So the way I try and combat this is through modularity. So if we can modularize our files, it means we can adapt to change much easier. So what's currently available? So we, are, we can either use one massive single file, which ends up looking like that, where you've got 1,372 lines of code, and you just don't want to go and look at it at all. And then you've got task runners, gulp, grunt, broccoli, and then you've got mon module bundlers. So require.js, browserify, webpack, JSPM. Uh, what I find is that the, if you modularize your code, you find that junior developers can actually go into your code, abstract, and go between the files much easier than going into a single file. Because the problem with JavaScript is, because it's a script, you actually have to go through the whole file to actually get the full understanding of what's happening, because you can go and change any of the variables at the top. And it can become a mess for a junior developer to go and actually understand a single piece of code. So is it good enough? We've got our current tools. They've got inconsistencies. They're almost there. Uh, JavaScript tier 6 modules are not yet standard, so it makes it a little difficult for uh, module bundlers to actually give us what we want. But they're almost there. The standards are coming through, so we're almost there. Uh, and not all libraries and frameworks play nice with uh, module frameworks and tools. Mainly Angular.js. Don't like using Webpack with it. Tried it once, never will again. Uh, so why do we need these tools? JavaScript is fragile. Uh, unlike CSS and HTML, they're pretty decorative. You can get away with, the browser can handle quite a lot of mistakes and still render fine. JavaScript, on the other hand, you get one line, one line of code wrong, it goes and breaks your whole site. So we need to be able to modularize it so it becomes less likely to go and destroy itself. So. These are the core principles that I kind of keep to. So modularization is very important because of that. You go and keep on adding to make the ball bigger, for example. It goes and explodes. You can't maintain it anymore. And by modularizing it, you can go and get those little gains that actually make it worthwhile. So the reasons for this is it improves the application structure, uh, minimizes the inner dependencies, uh, sing implementation details, so it makes it really easy to go and look at a file and understand what's happening. Uh, you've got improved performance, state management, risk, reduced risk of deployment, which avoids that, and then it's easier to test and plug and play environments, and that's what we want really, is to be able to go and take a bit of code, plug it in, take it out, use it where we like. Uh, maintainability is important, because can you tell me what that bit of code does, and that's actually live in some code that I'm currently developing. It's horrible. I, I didn't develop it, but I don't have a clue what it does, and this is within other for loops, within other for loops, within a while loop, and you just can't understand what's happening. So to be able to make maintainable code is critically important. important. So complexity affecting maintainability will always inherently cause more, more complexity. So what we want to do is to make our code not used for a while. So we can achieve that through maintainability. So performance is important. No one likes a spinner. Uh, the ability to modularize into core concerns can help your application itself get much more performance out of it. And then performance itself can be hindered by your build tools. And more than often, uh, you're using Grunt, Gulp, and you're trying to watch the task, and then because your site's now expanded so much, the performance becomes so hindering that you're not as inclined to work fast, you can't get stuff done, 
things start to fall apart because your team's constantly fighting battles that they shouldn't be having to deal with. So scalability is important. So by mo making it modular, we can then start to abstract more. So there's a great art article by Adi Asami, uh, and it tells you about how to scale your JS. It's brilliant, well, well worth a read, so if you've got time, give that blog a read. And scalability itself ties into the, main, the core concepts of making things maintainable, making it performant, making it modular. It just ties it nicely. So this is kind of what I go by, the lift principle. So you want to locate your code easily, identify it, make it flat, that's your folder structures, and try to be dry. So we want to increase developers' efficiency and maintainability. So that makes our code more readable, simple, and it lasts longer. So we want to find quickly by having name conventions and direct, have directory structures that are easy and understandable. So we want to find exposure points within our code so that's identify. So you want to be able to open up a file and understand exactly what's happening. But just looking at the top of it, you don't want to have to go through the whole code to actually understand what that file itself is doing. Because more than often, I've had developers come up to me, what is this file doing? So you're putting all of the core concern at the top so you can understand what's happening. Uh, so we want a flat directory structure for as long as possible. And this is to help us locate our code really easily. And we want it to be dry as possible, so making it easy to understand your code. So the learning curve for new developers is really easy to make it maintainable. Right, so we'll do a bit of an introduction to Webpack now and see how that evolves to fit what we want to make our code more modular. <coughs> so it's kind of a task runner, but at the same time, it's not fully one. It just removes the need for one grunt and gulp, you can do most things with Webpack itself. Uh, it's a module and asset bundler, so it takes all of your assets. You've got Jade files, JS files, coffee files, images, CSS. It can all go bundle that into its output package of JS, so it'll go and convert your images into, and transform it into inline uh, data code. So we get benefit of being able to take small images like icons and put them in our JS files. So you've got less HTTP requests. And it's an asset transformation, so it pre-processes all of your assets. So the key features, so modules to bundles. We can compress our assets, inline our assets. We can even split out our code. So I'll go more into detail on that, but we can asyncly load parts of our code really easily. Uh, dead code removal, so that's really interesting. I've used that quite a lot. So your code, it can go and detect what code isn't being used and take that out from your code base. So if you're not important, I think it won't get put there. And then you've got certain functions that are being used twice within different functions. It can go and detect similarities and actually remove that dead code to so making your actual bundle smaller. Uh, source maps, application cache, and hot module replacement, which saves development time massively. So if we compare Webpack, so you've got the typical task runners. So you've got lots of plugins. Uh, they're not such as a module loader per se, they're just a task runner, so th they take a lot of glue in, but they can be adapted to actually making it into a module loader, so you can go and separate all of your files and bring them together. But it, it takes a little while to get that set up. Uh, there's tons of plugins, tons. Uh, there's traditionally a lot of gluing together with gulp and grunt, you end up having a, quite a big file of gluing everything together, which you could just have NPM scripts. Uh, and this, why we shouldn't use it and just go to NPM scripts or Webpack is this great article here. It properly goes into detail of how you can simplify your build tools not to have grunt or gulp anymore. Uh, so required.js, it's simple, well established, and this is a module bundler. Uh, Bundling the synchronous loading, optimizers, although the optimizer itself, the config's quite heavy, uh, performance isn't great. Uh, no static assets, so you can't go and say, I just want this to be a static asset, it will go and require it in. Uh, and it's AMD format, which is out of date, and it's quite messy, and it's not joyful to work with. So we've got Browsify. Uh, it's Webpack-like, and it's, it's much a 
simple alternative. It's got simple configuration, but however, it can be quite slow. It's got no static assets again. It's got an inferior bundling system. You can't get as much out of it. It's not as flexible. And yeah, it's limited, really. Although, as a small version of Webpack, if you don't want to have to go to Webpack, I'd recommend Browsify instead. And then we've got the final one of JSPM, which it's quite new. It's immature. It's ES6 compliant now, so that's one good thing. Uh, there's little support for preprocessors at the moment, and it requires a partner tool for precompilation. So I think this will become a good tool, and maybe even a Webpack competitor once it matures a bit. But at the moment, I don't recommend using it because it's just not mature enough yet. Uh, so Webpack itself, we've got our module loaders, bundles, splitting out code. There's many plugins for special requirements. Uh, it plays nicely with other tools. Its performance is really great, it's super quick, uh, and it's extremely flexible. The only downside is the docs are a bit messy, they're not great to read, but you can get most of the ideas from the docs, it's just you have to kind of go and learn yourself a bit more. So how does it work? Uh, so we've got our bundling and entries, which means consistency with our development environments. Uh, we've got some clear bundling strategies, and we got some. We can even abstract to common bundles, so it can go and take those bit of codes that we know is used in certain places. So it's used five places in a modal window, a basket, for example, and that bit of code is used at loads of places. We required it in quite a lot, and it will go. And we can create a common bundle and get that loaded in with every part of the application, so you can split out your application into core concerns. Uh, and then we've got multiple entry points for multi-page applications, and it's brilliant for single-page applications. So I definitely recommend it if you're creating a single-page application because it's so flexible in the way you can make your single-page application more performant, whether that's splitting out the code more or actually getting to the nitty-gritties of where the modules are being required because it gives you great, great breakdown of what so you can use uh, the dev tools and it will tell you what actually is being used, which modules are being used where, so you can see which parts of code aren't being used much and it could be integrated somewhere else. Uh, so with our outputs, uh, we can version them, which makes it really easy for maintainability because it's flexible enough to support any different deployment strategies so we can go and put hashes and the hashes are done for your content. So in order to make your, each time you go and serve a new script file to your client, it's not going to, if it's not changed, it's content, so you might have a split, t uh, a main package that's split out, and that bundle itself, if it's not changed itself, but you've got other bundles that have changed, because that's gone from its content, that uh, prefix at the end won't change, so you're serving the same content, so it makes it bef more performant for the users, so you're not releasing something, and then each time you release something, you're having to give a user the new download of the, your site or application. So there's loaders. So Webpack works with JavaScript out of the box. Uh, loaders extend that functionality to other files, so they apply the transformations that you want. So you can have a JSON file, so you can bring in that JSON. And you've got loads, so I'll quickly scroll down. You can see how many there are. There's tons. So you can load in pretty much what you like. And you've got service workers, uh, so you can be as flexible as you like, really. It just keeps on going. Right, so plugins again, there's quite a few plugins, and plugins themselves, uh, they help you modulize your code a bit further, gain some performance benefits, like removing uh, that dead chunk of code, uh, minifying it, so you've got some ugly JS uh, plugin, and you can order your, it will, your plugins that will order your script by what's executed first, so you know that bit of code needs to be executed first, it will go and work out the order and how your script should look. So code splitting, this is one of the most interesting parts of Webpack, is that you can get performance modular code from splitting out your code. So if you've got a basket that doesn't need to be loaded on demand of the page, you can go split out that chunk of code and it gets required uh, asynchronously. So that means that we give the initial load for the page much quicker, and then your application builds up while the user's interacting with your page. So if we look at the code, all you need to do is just say require.ensure, uh, array notation basket.view for example and then just require it in 
and then you can give the name of the it, it code itself at the end, like basket, and that will go and give the bundle's name basket, so it would be basket.js with your content hash somewhere. Uh, so this fixes the issue of having a massive monolithic code. So you can either have loads of unmaintainable imports everywhere, or you can have a massive bundle of code, which this goes and fixes nicely because you can split out really easily your bits of code to logical areas. So hot module replacement, this is a really interesting concept. Uh, you can do this with Browsify and Webpack. I'm not sure about JSPM, but I'm pretty sure it will be available. Uh, so it helps our development workflow massively. So Webpack itself tracks its module dependency tree. So when it uh, updates, so we go and update a bit of code, you can go and inject that bit of code back into your browser and plugins like React and Vue, so they've got their own uh, hot module replacement plugin that will then go and replace the state as well. So you're filling in a form, for example, so you're on the login page, you filled in the form, noticed the bug, you can go and fix that bug, and it will go and, without reloading the page, go and recheck, place that uh, JavaScript, inject the state again, so you can continue developing, so it saves a lot of time in development. So this is how it kind of looks. So initially on compile, it will go to the compiler, you've got a bundle of server, and it will go and pass that bundle, and that becomes your code. But when we go and change something, it'll go to the compiler, go to our hot, mo hot module reload server, which is built into Webpack, and then go to the bundle, and then the runtime itself will pick up on that, and then inject that code back in. So it takes a quick pass. You don't have to go and compile your whole, whole code base. So if you make a change, it goes and compiles that bit of code, that module itself, so it's quick and updates. So if we put it all together, so I'm going to run through some code examples, all the config for Webpack, so you can get an idea on how it's set up. And the great thing is you can go and make your configuration modular itself. So you're not having a massive single page just on your build scripts, which gets unmaintainable. You can actually go and split that out itself into production code and development configurations. So this is our base config. So we have uh, at the top path, so that's standard uh, node. Uh, and then we resolve a path just so we know where the output is. So if you look at the top part, that's our entry. So we're saying where the source is. So that's our main entry point. So it's main JS, and that's where all your requires start happening from. And then you've got your output. That's where it goes to. And then the file name. So you can do stuff like bracket name, and it will go and do that for you. So by the name of the file main, it will go and create that as it's simple. So you don't have to have a massive build script saying, oh, if this gets I import this, acquire that one, I want it to output with this name, you just buy your entry points. So then you've got your loaders in a little object, of an array. So if we add the loaders in there, we've got Babel, so it's quite simple. So we just want to load Babel to compile our files. We say what type of files we want to compile, so .js files. Uh, we want to exclude the node modules from being compiled, and then that loader will go every file and pre-compile it for us. And then the same for images, you can go and take that into bytes. So instead of having to have multiple HTTP requests, which slows down your application, you can go and get those small size images that say under 10 KB, and put that inject that into your code itself. So it makes it really fast. Your code's more performant. Uh, so you can do things like as you see with the name extension hash, that's what I meant by you can webpack us some short codes to make your life easier with your config so it doesn't get messy. Uh, so if we want to extend our base config, so that's our base config, so we'd have that in a base the webpack.js file. And then we can go and extend that with webpack merge. So we can merge ours and create simple development Co uh, config and production config. So they, your base config is pretty much what it's going to do, and then you can do some slight variation depending on development, like setting up a server, for example, or with production, you want to minify your code, so you can go and separate out, and it makes your code or build tools really easy to reason with. So for development, we extend in the base config. <coughs> so we want to say debug on true, so we can see the output through the 
uh, CLI so we can see what's actually happening. And then we've got the dev tool. So with a Webpack, you can have source maps and then you can have evaluated source maps, uh, inline source maps, and evaluated source maps are evaluated inline. So basically it will go and create a snippet in, in your code and say this is the source map. So it's really quick to replace those source maps because that's one of the bottlenecks when you're actually developing is your source maps take a long time to generate. And then Webpack is a really cool tool for evaluation source maps, which on demand, it will go and just replace a string so it's really easy to regenerate. Uh, and then we can say, let's set up a dev server, so we've got some history API fallback set up, and then we don't want any info produced from there. And then you can do other stuff like set up proxies and stuff, which I'll go into a bit more in detail. Uh, so with our production, it's very sim similar, all, but we're just adding some plugins to say, I want to optimize this bit of JS, and I want to have the occur occurrence order plugin. So it stays f very sim simple, and then we're just modifying the output as well, just to say I want to use the chunk hash, which would be a two, one, wherever that hash is, by your content. So you're just making small variations onto your actual original base config to get the best, easy to un and most understandable uh, production code. Right, so if we're gonna use this within our actual package.json, uh, we've just put Webpack dev server for our dev, and then inline and hot. So that's basically saying we want hot replacement there, and we want it to, re if hot replacement doesn't work, we just want it to reload the whole page. And then we're specifying the config file. So we've got build uh, webpack.dev config, for example, and then for the actual production code, we just run npm run build, and then it will just do webpack itself without setting up a dev server. So Self-express, it can be expanded much heavily. So instead of having that simple base config, you can go and set up your own express dev servers uh, with the Webpack dev middleware. And this gives you custom implementations. I won't go into detail on this because there's lots of resources online. And this is when you're actually getting in depth with Webpack to actually get custom implementations to fit your build tools. So we've got assets in memory. So this basically means that all of your code gets served in memory. So instead of it writing to disk, which takes a long time, it will go and serve that within the memory. So it makes it really quick. And your build tools are really fast. And without having to worry about, oh, this is going to take 10 seconds to build each time I change a line of code. Uh, and then proxy tables. Now, this is really interesting. So say a lot of people will be working on a VM, right? So Instead of running your front end code on the VM, we can then extract it out of the VM, have it running on its own instance and its own dev server, and we can proxy all of the API requests to your actual VM. So your back end code is where it needs to be within the VM, but your front end code can run outside, meaning your updates are really easy to watch and update upon. Because the problem with uh, if you're running from vagrant boxes or anything is that each time you go and change a file, it takes a while for that to be transposed onto the box itself. So it's really slow to actually update. Uh, and then we've got actionable events. So we can actually hook into Webpack itself and do custom things based on build tools. So they've even had experimentations where they've got hot, mo hot module replacement working in a production environment. So when they actually deployed Sync, they'd uh, just replace that snippet of code. So there was actually people would only get small snippets of code changes with each deployment, so which is a really interesting concept. It's not production ready at the moment, but it was a quite a cool example of how you can expand Webpack to do more for you, especially within deployment processes. And it's much more flexible as well. So we can look at how hot module replacement actually works. So this is using Vue itself. If you've not used Vue, it's a great framework. It's super simple to use. Uh, you can like React, you go and put all of your concerns into one file, but you're not mixing it. Uh, and it's really simple API. It's a brilliant tool. Uh, I definitely think when it comes with Vue 2.0, which is going to be released, it's going to be a React competitor. It's going to be it's super fast. It's reactive itself, so each property is update. But if we actually look into the main code itself with hot module replacement, if you see that we're changing the template, and then it will go and update. So without refreshing the page, it's updating those bits of code. And it even works with JavaScript. So you're actually replacing 
state within your JavaScript. So we're saying new date, and then it changes there. So your JavaScript gets replaced itself, which is really incredible for development workflows. So rather than having to reload everything, you can just see changes happening as you're developing. And then the same for CSS, which is pretty standard nowadays. So if you find this is too much, uh, there's a great tool uh, by Fuge.js that basically gives you the build tool itself. So you can have go to this repository and you can actually see how it's all set up. And this is the advanced version. So they've got a simple one as well, which the simple one is just one single file. It's really simple to start getting working with. But if you really want to go in depth with Webpack, this is a great place to start getting your head around it. Uh, I've run this pretty quickly. So do we have any questions? Like, would you, anyone have any examples how they want to do something with Webpack, Browsify, to make their code more modular? No? Well, that was easy. <laughs> Did anyone understand me? Because I speak really fast. <laughs> right, I think that's it then. We get an extended lunch break. I oh, know, we've got a question. Um, I'm not even too sure how to phrase the question, but how would this work? Within the context of building, say, a Drupal theme, I know this is quasi Drupal. Uh, so I've not really used Drupal much myself, but. Say, any of the CMS whereby you don't have full control over yeah. the entire thing that's going on the page, and you're responsible for a small thing, but there's other modules in there as well. How could Webpack help with that scenario? Uh, so I just guess it depends how Drupal itself will go and create it. So I know Meteor.js kind of got a Webpack equivalent, so they kind of bootstrap on how Webpack does things. So I guess Drupal could kind of make a custom version of Webpack to be able to deliver better performance. So you'd have to go into the internals of how Webpack itself works, but that would be for the core team to go and evaluate how to do it. Uh, in terms of doing it yourself, I guess if you're creating completely custom themes and people, they're offline in their own repository, then it's a, it's, you can use Webpack in that scenario, but if you're just creating custom small themes actually within the CMS, it's probably going to be a bit difficult to use Webpack or even any other tool because you just you'd create small JavaScript snippets and yeah. CSS, and you can't really separate that out. Any other questions? All good. Who wants to go for some lunch? Beer. <laughs>